run through on web data connectors. The beauty of web data connectors, now they've got them uh, pre-made for some things, but you can go and attach to your own Fitbit watch or a huge variety of other data sources. So it's massive flexibility. Chris is going to give us a walk through that. So they're two really quite nice presents. Um, the other thing, just to make sure, is there anyone not aware of Tableau Conference? No hands going up here. Mm -hmm. No, I don't see any other hands. In the... <laughs> Fred, was that your hand going up a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going there to support Paul, I'm just saying. That's it, that's it. And we've got Paul Ross here, who is qualified for the Iron Beast competition. Uh, three people in the world get to compete in that, so it's actually a massive accolade. Uh, it'll be amazing. Um, so, if anyone uh, do get there, are still some discounts and that sort of thing available. Uh, Fred, you got anything you want to add on there? Uh, all I can add on to it is, I've been to about four of these now. They're the most amazing conference slash event that I've been to. They're incredible. You learn a lot. The networking is unbelievable. Fred, you got anything to add in there? No, really. I'm just, that's my first one. Um, of this, a few other people from Brisbane going, a few from my yep. work as well. John is on the call. Sam, I think, is going. Yes. Uh, it's pretty exciting to be, I'd be dressing up in the, I don't know, Something crazy to distract Paul. <laughs> <laughs> like a giant banana or something. Oh. <laughs> that, excellent. Okay. Um, over to Visa. Thank you, Dave. Good evening, everyone. So I'm Isa Hassan. And today, what I'm planning to do is a small demonstration of. Tableau API with some real world use cases. We are by accessing some simple API endpoints, how we can enhance our business intelligence. So, a uh, quick intro about myself. So, I have a bachelor's in software engineering and got about four years of working experience back at Sri Lanka, which is where I'm from. You guys could have noticed. Uh, but then uh, I did my master's in IT in QT, majoring in data science. And ever since I've been working in key data, uh, I've been working as a data analyst consultant, a data engineer, and currently I'm a senior data engineer here. And uh, in the past, I've held uh, Tableau data analyst and Tableau consultant certifications. But uh, currently, my focus is towards DBT, Snowflake, uh, Tableau server management, and AWS management. Uh, so. That's a small intro about me. Uh, so let's, uh, let me have a small introduction about API itself. What is an API? So API is an interface between requests and services. So you can think about it as a waiter in a restaurant. So when you are a customer, you don't have to understand what happens behind the kitchen. You look at the menu, you point at something, and you say, I want this, and the waiter brings it, right? So that's exactly how an API works. You um, uh, you simply tell the API, this is what I want, and it just brings it to you. Uh, and it works as a request and response cycle. You send a request, you get a response for that request. Then you send another request, you get a response for that. So that's how API works. Why should we use an API? So API is simply hardware, platform, and language independent. So you can implement an API in any uh, platform using any language, as well as you can send the request using any platform and any language. All you have to make, make sure is it follows an architecture, so there are some rules and regulations. And there are a few uh, typical architectures listed here, REST, SOAP, and RPC. But REST is the most uh, widely used uh, API architecture. And again, Tableau is also utilizing REST to provide its API endpoints. So what you might just want to know about REST endpoints is it has four types. Get requests are sent to get an object. Post is to create an object. Put is to update an object. And then delete is to delete an object. Simple as that. So let's uh, start off uh, with a small demonstration. So to do anything with API, first you have to authenticate yourself. You have to make sure that you have the access to do what you want to do. 
So to do so, uh, what are the information that you have to provide in order to uh, authenticate yourself? So either you can use username or password, which is the traditional approach, which I would recommend, or you can use uh, access token and name. So uh, you can generate an access token uh, by going to your Tableau server and under your account settings, you go to the settings and there is a section called personal access token. So if you just go to that section and you can generate a personal access token and utilize that to do all your API accesses. And since uh, 2022.3, uh, Tableau has introduced a JSON web token uh, from Tenetter Labs, which is quite exciting. I still haven't had time to explore that further new, but it's really awesome. So other than that, uh, you need to know, like when you're sending a request to authenticate yourself, you need to know what is the server name, uh, what is the API uh, version corresponding to the current server version you're requesting to, and what is the site that you're trying to get into. So let me quickly switch to a bit of code. So uh, I have set up uh, a few things. So let me first show you what I have set up. Uh, so there is a Tableau site where I have a simple workbook that utilizes a super store data source, which is coming from a database. And I have set up a group where it's called tab group and it's simply empty. It doesn't have anything, uh, any users in it. So uh, following that, if we go to the code, I have a configuration file set up. So, uh, it looks like this. I don't want to share the actual configuration file uh, because it has sensitive information. So this is the typical structure of that configuration file, but you can uh, utilize, if you want to get information from a database or like you want to get uh, information from Excel file or configuration file, it doesn't matter. You can utilize any of it. And uh, so if I go back to authenticating myself, uh, the initial authentication, I'm using a direct uh, post request via uh, the Python request library. So how it works is I initially connect to the configuration file and obtain the relevant information. So for example, I am using a flag to say, uh, do I want to use username and password or uh, do I want to use personal access token? So if it, uh, I always set it to true, so I, uh, utilize the personal access token instead of username and password. And then I'm getting the server name, the version, the site URL ID. And then uh, I, I'm also getting the username and password as well as the personal access token. Then I'm setting up a sign in URL. The sign in URL is simply the server and the version setup. And this is how the structure is it's just server slash API slash version slash port sign in. And we had to pass some information to it to authenticate ourselves, right? So the payload is set up as credential where I'm setting up the personal access token, um, the secret token, and I'm mentioning what site I want to log into. So same setup I have uh, also set up. So you can look at username and password as well as the site information. And I'm identifying which one to go through by this flag. So everything is done. What I simply have to do is say request or post and what is the URL, the payload and the header. Then I'm simply I'm signed in. So when I sign in, I get back a token from the response and that using that token, I can authenticate myself uh, multiple times up to 240 minutes by which the access token I have uh, gets invalid and I have to re-authenticate myself. So uh, in this case, I am setting it up to a token and then to print out some value, I'm getting the site ID from the response as well. And I'm just printing sign is successful. This is the site. And I am also wanting to sign out here. So I set the header, the header value with a token and then I'm setting up a sign out URL and simply just sending another post request, which would sign me out. So let's see how this functions. So authenticate. So it's as quick as that, right? So I sign in, I print out the site, uh, site ID and I sign up. 
So this is what we do use to uh, CP authenticate and do any, any API activity that we want to do. So following that, let's see what we can do. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Uh, so using that authentication, how long does the session last? 240 minutes. So does it give refresh tokens or anything? Or it just... uh, so you can get refresh tokens. So if you don't do it, like in 240 seconds, it expires. But every time you refresh, the token gets refreshed. A new token would be obtained as well. So um, we checked out what authentication is. So let's look at a few use cases where we, uh, in Kinata, we utilize <coughs> API. So one very simple use case is triggering an extract refresh. Why do we need to do that? We have schedules. We can schedule the extract to refresh, right? But typically, we have an ETL process. And the, after the ETL process finishes, we want the extract to refresh. But when more complexity comes in, more data comes in, the duration of uh, how long the uh, ETL process runs is going to change. So every time you have to guess how long it's going to run and do a shape. But by running a few lines of code, what you can simply do is put this as part of your ETL process. So you can always be sure the ETL process is completed and then the extract is refreshed. So to do that, what do you need? All you need to do, uh, need to know is what is the data source name, or you can tag it and use the tag to uh, identify this as well. So let me go back to the code. So I have an extract refresh set up here. So all I'm, uh, from here onwards, I'm, plan I'm using Tableau Server Client, which is a Python library uh, Tableau has provided. Uh, it's official and like quite useful. When we have this, we don't even know, need to know something like uh, the version of the site because uh, everything is handled internally. We can simply just say, use the server version, whatever the server version is, utilize that, something like uh, uh, a Boolean value. So to do this extract refresh, I get the relevant information from the configuration file. Uh, and I'm also getting the data source, uh, this is made. This is, again, I'm uh, obtaining from the configuration file. Then I'm authenticating myself then I'm setting up a filter for the data source name. So I'm filtering by the name and I'm providing the value as data source name. And using that, I'm retrieving the data source and uh, simply just saying server data source, refresh this data source. That's all I'm doing. So all you need to do the, the extract refresh is this. Uh, and he, following that, I know that it uh, would take under five minutes for it to refresh. So I have set up some uh, code so uh, we can monitor it. And once it's complete, the extract refresh is completed, uh, we would get this information, such as data source created that started at something like that. So uh, let me show in the data source. At the moment, the last refresh was at 437 for uh, data source. So I'm going to run. So it would take a few seconds because uh, it has to complete the extract refresh and provide us. So it's where to extract refresh files, the code that you were just looking at, VS code, correct? Yep. So if so, it was successful. Here it says sample data, uh, superstore data source. And if I go back here and refresh it, it was successful and was triggered at 529. So doing refreshes like this ensures that uh, we can always be quick as well as make sure that the ETL process is complete. So we can get it done when we actually want it to get it done. So following that, uh, the next uh, uh, use case that we utilize is add or remove user from a group. So group is how we uh, manage permissions. And when we have thousands of users, it's cumbersome to make sure that Okay, this this user is in the right group, and should uh, should he be moved to another group, something like that. So here, by using uh, in this case, I'm using some configuration file information, but you can have a CSV or Excel or database table as the source, and when something changes in that, that can be the trigger point for this code, and you can make sure that uh, we add or remove the user from the right groups. So to do that, what do you need? You just need to know the group name or a tag for that and the username of the user who you want to change. 
So let me switch to the code. And yeah, just for those that aren't familiar with Python, these each of these up here is one of the Python files yep. that these is running just for those simple commands. Most people I think here do understand Python enough to understand how that's working, but just in case. Fair enough. Yeah. I have like a few files here, so I'm just switching between these files. And again, I have I'm getting obtaining relevant information from the configuration mm -hmm. file. So I'm uh, here. I'm getting what is the group name I want to switch to, and what's the group username I want to switch to, and then I authenticate myself. Then first I get the group by filtering on the group name, and then I get the user by filtering on the group user's name as well. Then I, using these filters, I retrieve this group as well as the user. Then I'm simply saying server groups add user, and group. Uh, uh, this is the group, and this is the ID of the user. So that's all we have to do to uh, add a user to the group. So to show you guys, um, now I can, if I go into this star group, there is no user. Then I'm going back here and just write in the code. Okay, that's it, right? It says it's successful. So let's see whether it was actually successful. I simply refresh the page, and as you can see, the, uh, the user has been added to this group. So again, uh, we might want to remove the user, right? So what I'm going to do here is comment this line out, and uncomment this. So here, again, I'm just saying server group, remove this user from this group. That's all I'm saying. And again, I'm just going to run this. And that's it. So if I go back to this group and refresh it, the group user is gone. So uh, by using this, it would be quite powerful when uh, it takes out a lot of manual work or interactions that uh, can be automated with like a few lines of code here. So the next uh, use case I would like to discuss is updating the DB connection of a data source. So for security reasons, it's good to always like change the credentials. But let's say you have like hundreds of data sources which, are, which have embedded user and passwords. Now, how are you going to change that? Are you going to individually go and alter it? It's going to take so much time, right? So with API, you can automate it, and with a few lines of code and a few minutes, you can get it done. So what do you need for that? You just need to know what is the data source name and what's the new credential you want to set it up with. So let's switch to that code. Uh, so again, okay, I'm getting uh, a few relevant information from the configuration file, and then I'm going to say, OK, what is the data source name? And this is the current uh, database username. So at the moment, I'm only going to change the username of uh, the data source. So this is the new database username. And the password, I'm uh, thinking of like uh, letting it be as it is. Uh, but we can change it if you want as well. So then I authenticate myself. And again, as per usual, I get the data source name filtered by the name. And I obtain the data source itself. Then here, I have to get the connection. So uh, I'm populating the connection and creating an endpoint, which uh, looks at the data source and the workbooks. And I create, I get the function. There's a function called update connection. So I uh, create a variable to hold the update connection function. So after that, I simply say connections username is, it says current database username. So I'm going to change it to new database username. OK, so there's been a question. Yeah. Um, Chris McClellan's asked, uh, is this for live connections only or extracts as well? So uh, this can be used for both. Uh, at the moment, the example that I'm showing is for an extract. But it can be changed. And another point uh, to add here, the API works for both Tableau Online, Tableau uh, Server, as well as Fred Conductor. So you can utilize for any of these as well. 
uh, thanks for the question. So I have set up, I'm going to set the username to the new database username, password and remaining it as it is. And I'm saying, okay, I want to embed the password. And then I'm just going to run uh, Okay, so here it says data source connection credentials updated. So I could be like, it could I could have just written the line saying that, right? So to test it, what I'm going to do is I updated the credential of the same data source we saw earlier. So I'm going to do the extracted fresh now. So I'm running the previous uh, uh, file that I ran, doing the extract refresh. So now, ideally, it should fail. <laughs> thing is trust so as you can see it says uh, the authentication failed for the user wrong username because that's the username I provided and it failed so let me go back and set it right so I'm going to say uh, current database username and I'm going to run the update let me clear it up so it's easy for you guys to see the commands. So update the DB connections again. And I'm going to do another refresh to ensure that it is working. So we can go back here and look at the jobs. As you can see earlier, it failed at 536 and it's because the password authentication failed, but the current one, completed successfully. Follow it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yep. Just a quick question from Chris. Yes. Was it a question for you, Chris, or something about love connections? Ah, uh, we've already covered that, sorry. We've already covered that? Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. No worries. So, Thanks, uh, Fred. Uh, so the uh, last use case I want to discuss here is downloading the content. So the use case is that uh, there have been several instances where we want to download a workbook as either PDF, PNG, something like that, with like you know a few filters applied, and it needs to be stored in a certain location, or it needs to be emailed, or something like that. And Tableau uh, already would provide you with uh, emailing the information. But if it's an email and you need like 20 uh, images or PDFs, then you have to download each of it and put it in a location. But here, we can simply just automate it. So what do you need to know for, to download the content? You just need to know what is the workbook name, or like again, you can go by tags, uh, and then what is the filter name, and what's the value you want it to have. So to uh, show this, I would like to first show what dashboard I have. It's very simple, guys. Uh, very simple dashboard. So uh, it's using the uh, Superstore data store. And we just show the profit versus sales by the quarter. And I have a filter here. So I have the options to choose furniture, office supplies, or technology. So how I have set it up is I'm going to download a PNG with where the filter is set to furniture and a PDF where the filter is set to technology. So let's see how that works. So again, I get relevant information from the configuration file. I set up what is the workbook name I want, what is the output file name I want, and then what is the filter key one value is, uh, filter key is, and what is the value of it is. Again, filter key two is, and what is the value for that is. Then I authenticate myself. Then again, I set, get the filter, workbook filter by name, and I get that uh, filtered out. And then in that workbook, I get the relevant view. So I only have one view here, so I, I know that I only have one view here, so I simply just get that. Then I am setting an option, uh, which is the filter, to say, OK, filter one key and uh, one value is what I need for that. And then I simply just say, download the image uh, to this location. So this is downloaded as a PNG with the extension saying image export. 
And then again, I'm going to say fill the key two and the value two for the options. And then uh, I'm going to download it as a PDF here. So let's see how that works. Uh, I had an earlier version downloaded, so let me just delete it. Uh, as you can see, there is no files here. Then I'm going to run. Okay, just download it. So if I go back to these files, I have uh, the dashboard downloaded where the category is set to furniture. So that's the image. And then I am downloading the PDF. They are uh, the same thing, category is set to technology. So you can have multiple filters, selected multiple various values as well, and you can obtain this information. So that concludes my uh, demonstration. So other than that, I just want to touch on one point, which is webhooks. So if you guys are interested in APIs, you guys would love webhooks. So webhooks are more event-driven communication between applications. So you can think of it as a reverse API. If you, in API, if you want something, you request it and you get a response, right? But in webhook, previously you would have set up, okay, if uh, extract fails, ping me to this server, like I have a server here, ping me and say, okay, extract failed. So then you will go about your day and if the exact function occurs, it would be triggered and Tableau would reach out to you and say, hey, your extract has failed. So this helps you in a lot of critical event-driven reporting. When there is a lot of uh, business critical uh, processes happening and you want to know things immediately, rather than getting an email, you can automate this to send an SLS. So you can do so many different things with uh, this code. So uh, only thing uh, is it also requires client-side infrastructure where yeah, you have to have a server constantly running and listening so that like if Tableau sends that, uh, Hey, there's a failure, you would be listening. So that's webhooks. Um, so for references, I have mentioned the uh, REST API document. And if you guys decide to go with traditional uh, request related uh, post, re uh, post request to sign in, sign out, uh, this link would help you to identify what is the uh, site version that you had to use. And then uh, client, uh, Tableau server client is the Python library that uh, Tableau provides. It's really awesome. So I encourage you guys to try it out. And the Git code of uh, the simple demo that I did is in this link, so you guys can access it there as well. So. If, if anyone would like to get that, it's, um, just send an email to info at Kiva, just asking for those links, and uh, we'll respond to those. There might be something else for that later on too. Sure. Awesome. So, that's it, guys. So, do you guys have any questions? That's awesome. I don't know it's not a question this time, but well done. It's very interesting. Any question online? Attendees, any questions? If not, thanks again, Vista. I'm, I'm going to draw the, the bag and do the, the wheel spinning. So, I think you probably need to stop sharing and I can share my screen for five minutes. Thank you. Let me show you the worst that I've ever Best screen. So I'm going, I'm going to draw your name. I love the people that... Clap, clap. Hold on. <laughs> uh, can you see my screen? Can you see the wheel? Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> So in there we've got forty-five names of people I've registered. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna spin one. If your name gets drawn, uh, I'll need your address because I can, I can ship the bag to you. The bag uh, is. I don't answer your name or my name. <laughs> 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 it's a fix. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the privilege of being the host. Uh, so the bag is. <laughs> the fact, I think it's a good, it's a good price. So as I said, uh, I'm only gonna ship to uh, people in Australia. So if we have. A, um, overseas guests, so bad. So I'm going to spin. Uh, there's a good chance that you're not here anyway because there's no way for me to check who's actually in the room. So I'm going to spin now. Yeah. 
<laughs> Is that person here? Ready to come? No? Okay. No? Okay, too bad. Gotta be quick. Sorry, you're here, are you? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think I can tell you somewhere. Uh, so, Sadi, I just need your personal address, um, and I'll uh, if you maybe ping me on LinkedIn or, or email, and I'll uh, I'll send the bag over to you tomorrow. Thank you, thank you. No worries. Right. Um, so over to you, Chris. Super Ambassador Chris is also talking at the Tableau conference. Um, a couple of seconds, get ready. If anyone needs a quick loop break or anything like that, probably. Are you here, Chris? I might say I was a host. Are you still here? Where is Chris? Here we lose Chris. Looks like he's not in the call anymore. He just dropped out. Fred, he might be just trying to reconnect. Maybe it just took a plane to join you guys. He's had some issues before. Ah, oh, I can't see him. I had permission before, and as soon as I clicked on share screen, it says you need to do all this other stuff. Yeah, so you want to try again? Or I don't know if I give you a no, no, I'm back in now. I'm just trying to figure out where to go. I'm, if I said you are supposed to, it might be easier. Can you show your screen? Can you see the share screen button? Oh, yeah, cool. Perfect. Yep, cool. Dave, you're good to go in the room? Um, no, no, Dave was saying you need to break. Is that right? Um, um, no, no. Uh, up to you guys in the room. You happy to uh, wait two minutes or we start now? Um, well, Dave's just left out for a moment. <laughs> so, 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 he's, so he's not ready. He might have been the one that wanted the two minute break. <laughs> Visa, well done again. I think that's a super interesting talk. I read really it and I really learned a lot. That's good. Ties in nicely with this as well. I'm sort of talking about the other side of the API environment. It, uh, it's a dumb question on my part, but do you need special access on Tableau Server to do all that stuff? Like if you got Python running on your laptop, I'm thinking about work. I don't have access to uh, my work Tableau Server. I'm only a creator, uh, admin on my side, but do you need special permissions to run those things or not? So you need as much permission as what you've got as a creator. So obviously you can't refresh a data source in a yeah. project that you don't have access to. But if you've got access to a certain project, then sure, you can do all of that stuff. Okay. Good to go, Fred. Um, and, and then obviously you, you just log into Tableau server or cloud and create your personal access token and then you don't need the MFA because yeah. it's code logging in as you rather than you logging in. Mm, yeah, so cool. Tableau doesn't need to authenticate the person anymore because they're authentic you've already authenticated the process. Mm. Cool. Thanks, Rick. I think you were ready to go now anyway, so you can yep. just fly to your door. Easy. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, sorry, I'll start back on this slide. So, um, thank you for having me at Brisbane Tug. Um, I'm going to present on web data connectors, just an intro. Um, but to intro myself first, uh, my name is Chris McClellan. I'm, I live in Sydney, so not special for the Brisbane Tug, but special overseas. Um, I've been a forum ambassador for five times, and there's all my other contact details if you need them. And there's some little logos down on the left side about software that I prefer to use, but um, We'll, we'll look at those logos throughout this presentation as well. Um, what I'm talking about today is what is a web data connector? And and it's nice that this comes under, after Visa's talk because we need to, to know what an API is before we talk about web data connectors. And it's, it ties in nicely with Visa's presentation because a web data connector is when we're actually connecting to data that's available via an API where he was talking about interacting with Tableau via an API. Everything's an API. Um, I won't be doing any live coding. I'm not that game. <laughs> um, so as we probably know, with Tableau, we can have data connections for a whole heap of different things, so flat files or Excel files or direct to a database or other different databases, or maybe even a published data source which comes from server or cloud. 
depends on what we're using. But then obviously if we're not using any of those things, we can use an API as well if the data source we want to interact with actually has an API available, obviously. Um, so before I go any further, because this shapes the presentation as well, and, and obviously now that I'm sharing, I can't see the room or the chat room. Um, I'm assuming someone here uses Tableau Server. Yes? Yes. yes. And, and I'm assuming also that there's people in the room that use Tableau Cloud. Yes. Um, as far as yes. APIs and web data connectors are concerned, these two sit in completely different places. So as much as Visa has just been demonstrating that you can do all this cool stuff with the API on just Tableau, and it doesn't matter whether it's server or cloud, I'm going to get to the end of this presentation and you're going to need to, you'll see the big difference between server and cloud when we're talking about web data connectors. But firstly, we need to talk about an API. I'm not going to read all this out because we've just been through what an API is and what it does. Basically, it's computers talking to computers. So just to sum up Visa's presentation as well, what does an API do is we've basically got to send a method, a HTTP method to an API. And in general, APIs accept four different methods, get, post, put, or delete. And everything we just saw then, we're probably using the get and the post, but we're probably not using put and delete, especially not delete because all the Tableau APIs don't support that. You can't go through and delete certain things. Or maybe you can, depending on what the API does. And when you send a request to that API, it either gets a response from the cloud or from a database or from a database in the cloud. And then you get your data back in the form of usually JSON data or XML data. An API is just a way of communicating this to something and getting a response back. Again, we just had what, a half hour of awesome demos on that of how Tableau actually communicates we're doing it with data. So we can actually get data from any different websites that are out there. We might have a weather website, which could include anything from the bomb to your weather station at home, if you want to, if there's an API for that. We can get data from a currency exchange. We can get census data, depending on the country or other government data. Just anything that actually has an API attached to it and the API usually comes with documentation from that location as well. So we can pull from a whole heap of public APIs on, the, on this GitHub link. This, this is a Git, another GitHub account purely to just list off public APIs that you can pull data from. Um, there's another fun list about different things. Um, you can look at the most popular APIs that are around. And even things like Spotify, you can actually log into your own Spotify account and pull down all the stats about your Spotify playing habits. Um, and you'll see a lot of, if you've used Tableau for a while and you um, uh, sort of exist on Twitter sometimes, you'll see that what people do at the end of the year is pull down their Spotify data via the API and analyze it in Tableau. You can do that all the time. So the web data connector basically sits between an API and Tableau. It is Tableau's way of talking to APIs. You can't go directly to the API. You've got to build a web data connector so that Tableau can talk to the API. So the API can then go off and talk to whatever database you're connecting to. Now, it, this has changed very recently in Tableau. There was a thing called web data connector version two and there's a whole heap of links and there's a, there's a years of documentation built up about Web Data Connector version two. But fairly recently that's been deprecated. Now, deprecated doesn't mean that it's gone. Deprecated means that the suggestion is not to use it anymore. Um, and that will be, version two will be supported until 2022.4 goes end of life. So there's at least a year left in Web Data Connector version 2s. The new version is Web Data Connector version 3, which only came out very recently. And there's very little documentation about that. Um, <laughs> sorry? you got to laugh. I, I, I know, I'm laughing as well. It's like even when I was building this presentation, it is really hard to find concrete examples of version 3. 
Um, why? Because it is so new and everyone's been building version two stuff for years and suddenly we're moving to version three, but there's a little bit of life left in version two yet. Don't, there's no need to, to freak out and, and change it tomorrow. Um, we're being recorded, so I'll change the words on this. Go to the official Tableau website. Do not get um, confused by the wording. Some, on some of the Tableau pages, it says that web data connectors are being deprecated. And yes, they are, version two, but they are replaced by version three. There, there is a future to this, and it's running stuff in version three. Um, but let's say you want to do some stuff in version two, because version two is a lot easier to get up and going with and we've still got about a year or so of life left in that as well. Um, so if I take one of those links from Tableau, Tableau has built this, this um, demonstration a long time ago. It's just getting some earthquake data and there's eight simple steps to building a web data connector version two. And I'll walk through that quickly now. Um, but a lot of it's code, like we were watching Visa do, but we've got code working a different way now. So. Firstly, for a web data connector version two, we've got to create a HTML page. Um, if I was building a web data connector, I would just copy this code and I don't care about changing any of the code. If anything, I would change is line three and line 20. And that is purely because I don't want to see it say earthquake feed if I'm getting data from another place. So if I'm looking at my Spotify data, I might not want my web page to say earthquake, but it doesn't matter. It won't affect the, the way the web data connector works at all. Step two is I've got to build a connector object. Again, I would just copy and paste this. There is nothing to change here. You don't need to understand this code at all, but it's a little bit of JavaScript that hangs off the web page that we've just finished building. Then we need to add a web listener. Um, again, you might like to change line three because that will be your data source name once you get this into Tableau. So again, if we're using Spotify, you might call it My Spotify Data, or if you're getting data from the weather station or anything, change that line three to be appropriate. That's the data source name in Tableau. Step four, once we've got all that, we can actually test the connector. There's two different ways to do this. I can do it locally on my machine or Tableau has a, an online simulator that you can put your connector URL into um, and test it out. What we've also got to do, again, data, obviously we're querying the API, there's data coming back. What the web data connector does is explain to Tableau what the data is. So we're getting this, a JSON file or an XML file. What's in that file? How do I read it? What, how do I understand what's going on here? Um, so this, this part of, the, of your JavaScript file, you've got to define the data schema. So lines three to line six, um, exactly what fields are in that file? What do you want to call them? And what data type are they? So again, if you've got a, a, um, an API that's got 200 columns in it, you have 200 columns here with their correct data type attached as well. And then down the bottom, you might want to explain what that is as well, if you wanted to. Um, step six, we've now got to really go out to the API. So you can see on line two, that's the first time we've mentioned where we're going, where does this API live on the internet so I can get the data back. And when that data is fetched properly, we're getting in a JSON method because I can see at the start of line two, I'm using a get JSON function. So we get JSON data back and then the code loops over all the fields in that JSON and basically puts it into a more of a tabular format, columnar format that you're interested in and how, and, and how Tableau works as well. So once you've got all that code working, you can go back to the simulator and try it out. And again, I'm not going to run this right now, but I can, you can see how the simulator works. If you go to the simulator, type in your URL, and click on the Start Interactive Phase button, you get to this screen, and there's some of that you might recognize from the code before, where we can see our earthquake data, we can see our IDs, their fields, the, the data type of the field, the alias, etc. And then if our web data connector is working perfectly, we can click on the Fetch Table Data button, 
and actually see the data that's coming back from our API. So then, I think there's a step eight. Um, once we've got all that, we can actually go, on, go off and deploy that to either Tableau Server or Tableau Cloud. This is where we need to know if we're using server or cloud because things work completely differently. On server, you must be the server admin to approve web data connector files. So as Fred was just saying then with, with Visa's API stuff, if you're, an, if you're a user on either server or cloud, you can do all the stuff that Visa was showing you if you've got the right permissions on Tableau Server. If I've gone off and written my own web data connector and I'm on Tableau Server, I need the server admin to basically whitelist or safe list this API or this web data connector that I'm using. The server admin has to add it to the safe list and the secondary list. They can allow or disallow um, extract refreshes. And then most importantly is they need to restart the server for all those changes to be applied. Now, if you're using Tableau Cloud, you still have to host the web data connector files somewhere obviously not on Tableau Cloud, but you've got to have another server set up somewhere that accepts HTTP requests. And you've got to have Tableau Breach installed and configured properly as well. That's for version two. Version three, a little bit different, and I'm going to speed through this because I'm not going to go into that technical detail. But version three, Tableau's own documentation says this is pretty fast. So where a web data connector version two might take you a few hours to write, you can possibly do this in a few minutes. You need to know that you actually got, sorry, was that the question from the room or not? No. <coughs> um, so you need the dependencies installed and install the toolkit and verify the toolkits installed properly. That's, that's the first steps one to three. You only do that once. Um, and then you just basically at step five, create a connector using some of the boilerplate that Tableau's already provided you, change those files, create what they call the TACO file, which is a zip file containing everything that you need and just run the connector. It really is easy, um, but it can get a little bit like this sometimes. So normal coding stuff and Visa would have done this and everyone who's coded done this is sometimes you're just stuck in this loop forever of you can't get it to work. There's going to be error messages, there's going to be syntax, there's going to be all these things. And then finally, right at the very end, you're successful once. Yes, everyone, everyone who's coded anything has been through this loop as well. Um, so the comparison between the two, as we're saying, version two on the left, there's all these things that we talked about version two and version three, is the new, cool, better way of doing things. It's only available if you're running to 2022.3 onwards. Um, you don't need to host files anymore on version three, but you need a lot more setup on the machine. You need Node and NPN and Python and JDK and either, if you're using Windows, Visual Studio tools, or if you're using Mac, Xcode command line tools. Um, and that's about it for there. When you're using Tableau Desktop to connect to them, again on the left, if you're using version two, you've got to go into the Web Data Connector link and you've then got to know the URL that you're typing in. But obviously if you've typed it in for the first time, Tableau Desktop will remember that URL if you use if you used it previously. On version three, there is there is a web data connector option. But because we've actually created the TACO file, it just comes in as a native connector for whatever you've named it as. So you see on the right side, I'm using Tableau Desktop, but I've got a version three web data connector. So my data connector is actually called my first connector by vendor name, because that's the boilerplate template. And I would choose that. After that, they both work identically and they pull data back from the API and store it in an extract. So one of the questions that people ask sometimes, can I be live to my API? No, you can't. Tableau will always put an extract between you and the API. <laughs> Any questions at this stage? No, you're doing well, Chris. 
Cool, cool. Um, so let's go back to the first question. How many people are interested, and I'll, I'll rephrase the question a bit differently. How many people are interested in doing a web data connector for Tableau Server? Any hands up? Because I can't see from here. Uh, I'm counting about five hands at the moment. Okay. And how many people who cloud are thinking about using web data connectors as well? One less. Oh. Sorry, one. <laughs> There's a few. There's more a than zero. A couple. Okay. So I don't know if you missed the point that I was trying to make because I didn't make it that clearly, deliberately. Um, if you're using Web Data Connector version 2, you have to host your own Web Data Connector files and you can use Tableau Bridge. The bad news is if you're using Tableau Cloud and if you're, you want to, want to use Web Data Connector version 3 and you've built your own TACO files, there's no way it will work. Tableau Cloud only supports Tableau managed web data connector version threes. Mm. Okay, mm. okay. Um, so bit of bad news, but some good news as well, because there's some alternatives that you can use. Um, and I don't know if you've heard these terms before, but um, there's a term being thrown around at the moment called modern data stack, which is a fairly new term. Um, I've used this at a few of my clients who want to use Tableau Cloud and APIs and they don't want to do web data connectors at all. And you can use a stack that's similar to this. So he, I use Hevo, Snowflake, DBT, and then onto Tableau. You can put whatever you want there. Some people use Fivetran. You can use your own Python code. You don't have to use Snowflake. You can use any database, whatever. But you can't use web data connectors version three with Tableau Cloud. You've got to do this sort of thing. Um, or a really cool toy that I found about, I don't know, a week or two ago, is a thing called Wayscript, which is what they term as an internal developer platform, which means that everything that we saw Visa doing earlier and everything that I've been doing or I've been demoing now, you can do in Wayscript because it's almost like a, well, it is a virtual machine that runs all your Python code on the internet that can interact with Tableau and do these sort of things and move your code from an API through to Tableau and do exactly what a web data connector does, but you're not writing a web data connector. You're writing other Python code or Node or whatever your preferred language is to get through that. So if you know how to write all the code, then use something like Wayscript. If you don't want to bother about code at all, use something like the modern data stack to still pull API data in from wherever, Spotify, um, you know, Zero, Google Analytics, I don't really care, find a website that's got an API attached to it and bring it in through Hevo, Snowflake, DBT if you don't want to write code or, or low code and Wayscript if you want to write a lot of code, you've got to start from scratch. Um, sorry, and I've just done that summary anyway. So Web Data Connector version two, it's deprecated, but it's easier to set up and use. It's still got a bit of life in it left, at least a year from now. Web Data Connector version three, better for the future, but not a Tableau Cloud solution. And for Tableau Cloud, you've got to use an alternative approach. You can still pull data out of an API. Just don't think that you can use Web Data Connectors. It won't work properly. Any questions? Questions from the room? You've let them speechless, Chris. <laughs> That's really good. Yeah, very good session, Chris. APIs, web connectors, I think we're so clever, no? The, the funny thing, it's all the same thing, right? So, so even when you're talking to Tableau, you're just using APIs, um, exactly what Visa did. <laughs> And all I'm doing is pulling data in via an API. So it's, I think the, the motto to the story is learn how APIs work because that's how things are going to work in the future. Yeah. Yeah, couldn't agree with that more. The, um, uh, oh, sorry, Fred Gart. No, no, it's good. You're talking. I'm not talking. No, the um, APIs and what's going on in that data stack, so to speak, is 
man, I've, I've never seen it changing as quick as it is at the moment. Uh, I'm just watching what's going on, if I'm perfectly honest. And, uh, there's some good stuff going on. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, oh. Sorry, go on. No, no, that was about to uh, wrap up on my end. I mean, I, obviously, you guys are going to have a, a drink on us or pizza. Um, I was about to say, we meet usually every couple of months. So maybe May, June, July will be the next one. I'm always keen to um, to have people coming forward and, and volunteer to talk, like mm. uh, Chris and Visa did today. Uh, tips and tricks, tableau, technical stuff, or design principles. So if you're, if you're keen to uh, share your knowledge, come forward. I think that's appreciated because it's a community thing. It's, uh, it's not run by tableau, it's run by the users. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, quick reminder: I need the addresses <laughs> uh, if you want to get your bag, and also maybe a, a quick one on just to close off on my end. Um, good wish, a good, very good welcome, and then uh, good luck to Paul at TC when he's going to be on stage. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know if uh, uh, Aaron Viz is a video live. Do you know, Chris, if it's uh, live or not? Yeah, I think it's live. Yeah. yeah. You, okay. you two can wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning in Australia and watch it. <laughs> Definitely live. Uh, and it's, oh, man, the, Fred, you're going to be blown away when you hear the noise going on in that room. <laughs> it's, it's just nuts. So, yeah, thanks thanks again for joining. Uh, good luck, Paul. we we'll see you somewhere in the U.S. Uh, Sunny, I need your address <laughs> for the bag. And then uh, if no one else has any um, comment questions, thanks for joining. And then see you next time in a couple of months. Uh, I'd, I'd like to just give I'll a just... little update on something, Fred. Yeah, you go. So I know Chris is a big fan of DBT. Um, I've had some discussions with DBT. And if anyone in Brisbane is interested in learning or understanding what DBT is about, let me just share my screen. This will be something we're having on the 18th of May. Wherever I've got it. You could choose to meet us. Sorry? Oh, the wind. Ah, yeah, well done. Is the oh. meeting like Snowflake? Like, is that, that's a database, is it? Um, no, no. So, so if you know what ETL and ELT is, yeah, yeah. DBT does only the T. So they only do transformation. transformation. So you'll need a database for, to use DBT and you need a database that they support and they don't move the data in or out. They just move the data around. So that's why I love it with Snowflake because you're yeah. just saying, I've already landed my data in Snowflake. I need to get it to a point where I can use it in Tableau. And that's what DBT does, the transformations in the middle. Cool. DBT is all about reshaping the data. Yeah. You Hevo or Fivetran or whatever your tool of choice is for ingesting the data. You use DBT and it just turns into SQL transforming the data. Uh, but it, it's modern data stack, it's it's the next stage I'd be thinking. Your yeah. thoughts, Chris? Yeah, yeah. It's also, it comes with version control and scheduling and there's a whole, like, so DB, a lot of people go, oh, I don't need DBT because I can write SQL. Um, I was like that as well. I can write SQL, it's not a problem at all. Um, but DBT makes the SQL a lot easier because you're only writing select statements, but it has all the other stuff around it. So version control, orchestration, um, you know, a ton of stuff that comes just with the software straight away. It's awesome. Definitely worth looking at, especially if you're doing some ELT work. So if you do an extract and load into, I don't care what database you use, but probably not SQL Server, because I don't think DBT supports SQL Server. <laughs> and then you transform it before you use it in Tableau. Okay, thank you. And the other thing is um, testing. You can write uh, yes. tests really, really easily in it too. So. Yeah. So we're, we're having a day. We've got DBT. They, they happen to have their quarterly business review for AMZ on the 17th of May. So I said, oh, can we get a couple of you guys to stay over and give us a session on the 18th of May? So we're arranging a few different sessions. To be honest, it's not all set up yet. Um, it's happened very quickly. 
uh, but we'll certainly be having something along the lines of a, um, a, a one or two hour lunchtime session that's watching, this is what DBT is, is sort of following what's going on the screen and then in the afternoon we're potentially having something where you bring your laptop and work through with the guys from DBT uh, and a simple end-to-end -end example. Uh, this stuff is gold. I, mm. I said changing the way that data engineering is done. Uh, so if anyone's interested, because we haven't got everything set up yet, uh, at the moment it's about sending an email to info at PDATA, um, and then we'll be able to get back to you as we do get things set up. Cool. Very nice. Dave, sounds interesting. Pleasure. Yeah. Any, so, any other comments, questions? We're happy to uh, close off. Yeah. Well, thanks, everyone. And then we see you in a couple of months. And good luck again, Mr. Paul. You yeah. Be there in the front row. All the yeah. best, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Paul, how long will it take you to do your visualization? How many minutes are you going to have spent? <laughs> Four, four on a good run. Four, <laughs> four, four on a questionable run, but yes. I spoke to Pradeep, uh, who was a competitor a couple of years ago, and he said, yeah, yeah, aim for 16, because anything more than 16.